Elizabeth Smith Friedman, America's first federal law enforcement cryptologist. Elizabeth Smith was born in 1892 in Huntington County, Indiana, and grew up on a farm as the ninth of ten children. Only Elizabeth and one brother would go on to receive a college education. In 1915, Elizabeth graduates from Hillsdale College in Michigan with an English degree. A year later, she begins working for Colonel George Fabian, an eccentric millionaire and retired industrialist. At his Riverbank estate, Fabian employs scientists to experiment in progressive sciences, from sound waves to cryptology to genetics. At the think tank, Elizabeth begins working with Elizabeth Wells Gallup to examine Shakespeare's writing for hidden messages. Elizabeth meets William Friedman, a graduate student in genetics in charge of Riverbank's Department of Genetics. William not only falls in love with Elizabeth, he falls in love with her project, the examination of secret writings. William turns over his genetic project and joins Elizabeth in studying everything they can find on secret writings. As the First World War heats up and the U.S. moves closer to involvement, Riverbank becomes the official cryptologic service of the United States government. Not only are they deciphering encrypted messages for the war effort, but Elizabeth and William are also training the first class of Army officers in breaking codes. A month after the United States enters the war, Elizabeth and William marry. In 1917, Elizabeth remains at Riverbank to continue her study of Shakespeare's writings while William deploys to France to serve as a military intelligence officer. After the war, they resume their employment at Riverbank until, in 1921, Elizabeth and William moved to Washington, D.C., where William begins work as a civilian code expert. Elizabeth works for a short period of time for the Navy, but resigns in 1923 to give birth to her first child, a daughter named Barbara. By 1925, now five years into Prohibition, the country is experiencing a rise in organized crime's wealth, power, and influence in American society. Combating organized crime becomes the nation's highest priority. In close partnership with the United States Coast Guard, the Prohibition Unit recruits Elizabeth and hires her as a Prohibition investigator. Elizabeth works off-site in the Coast Guard's intelligence section. She begins breaking the encoded messages collected by the United States Coast Guard, the Radio Division of the Department of Commerce, and a small squad of Prohibition agents on the West Coast who have set up an impromptu listening post in San Francisco. These messages provide the operational plans and intentions of the organized crime groups. While working as an investigator, Elizabeth discovers that she is expecting her second child and has to formally resign. Informally, however, and without pay, she continues to provide her code-breaking services working on intercepted messages hand-delivered daily from the federal government to her home. Meanwhile, at Treasury, the leadership develops a national strategy to combat organized crime. The Division of Foreign Control is stood up under the Bureau of Prohibition. This strategy implements coordination, cooperation, and most importantly, intelligence sharing among the law enforcement arms of the Treasury involved in prohibition enforcement, the legacy agencies of ATF, Customs and Border Protection, the United States Coast Guard, and the Internal Revenue Service would now work as one. Elizabeth again is personally called to serve her country in the newly formed Division of Foreign Control. In 1927, Elizabeth returns to the Bureau of Prohibition. Assigned to the Division of Foreign Control as the sole crypt analyst, she becomes the tip of the spear in the fight against organized crime. This coordinated effort should be considered the foundation for joint task forces and fusion centers today. Elizabeth not only breaks the encoded messages, she conducts all source intelligence analysis on the decrypted codes, combining information from international police reports received at the Division of Foreign Control, along with other intelligence derived from undercover operations, wiretaps, informants, surveillance, and seized records. She turns out both strategic intelligence for operational planning and actionable intelligence for enforcement activity. Elizabeth essentially enables federal agents on the task force to make high-level, complex conspiracy cases against organized crime kingpins and their conspirators. Using Elizabeth's analysis, the government leadership formulates operations to systematically seize the contraband shipments boat by boat, dismantle outlaw radio stations, and seize their firearms and radio equipment, and disrupt the flow of illegal liquor into the United States. This turns the tide in favor of the government. In 1930, the Bureau of Prohibition is transferred to the Justice Department. 
Elizabeth remains with Treasury and transitions the mission and functions previously under the Division of Foreign Control to the Bureau of Customs, where she continues to support the Joint Task Force. In a final reorganization in 1931, Elizabeth transitions the mission and functions of the Joint Task Force to the Coast Guard, where she becomes instrumental in the creation of the first formal cryptanalytic unit as its first chief cryptanalyst. She selects and trains seven additional cryptanalysts to continue her intelligence-led enforcement efforts in support of all the federal enforcement agencies. In 1933, Prohibition ends, but organized crime's wealth, power, and influence over American society has never been stronger. The activities of these early organized crime groups can still be seen in operations of criminal enterprises today. As a result of Elizabeth's efforts, numerous vessels are seized, many notorious criminals are arrested, and huge, complex cases are tried. Some of her largest transnational smuggling cases of the day span from the Gulf of Mexico to both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts to two opium smuggling routes from China to Hawaii and China to San Francisco. Her court testimony routinely results in multiple convictions. She even lends her skills to an espionage case which garners her much unwanted media attention. In 1938, Elizabeth is honored with a PhD from her alma mater, Hillsdale College, for her extraordinary service to her country. Seven days after the Japanese forces bomb Pearl Harbor, Elizabeth goes to work building codes and ciphers for William Donovan as he was organizing the Office of Strategic Services. Meanwhile, the United States Coast Guard is transferred to the Navy, and Elizabeth serves the remainder of the war as a civilian cryptologist under the direction of Navy intelligence. After World War II, the United States Coast Guard was returned as a law enforcement arm to the Treasury in January of 1946. Elizabeth would go on to serve seven more months in her law enforcement career before a post-war reduction in force throughout the government requires that she resign from service, just 18 months short of her retirement eligibility. In retirement, Elizabeth and William returned to the project that had first seduced them into the world of cryptography, examining the Shakespearean ciphers. Their book wins them a Folger Shakespeare Library Award in 1955. After William's death in 1969, Elizabeth spends her retirement compiling a bibliography of his work and library for presentation to the George C. Marshall Foundation in Lexington, Virginia. This library is considered to maintain one of the most extensive collections of cryptologic material in the world. Elizabeth passes away in 1980. Her headstone is engraved with her lifelong mantra, knowledge is power. The Women in Federal Law Enforcement Foundation is proud to recognize Elizabeth's contributions as a pioneer in intelligence-led policing. In her honor, we announce the Elizabeth Smith Friedman Award of Excellence.